Hello, everybody. My name is Sean Eddy, and today I'll be giving a presentation about how we can use CO2 filters to help prevent climate change. I did this project with the help of my mentor, Natalie. In this presentation, I will introduce topics to describe my motivation, talk about current technologies, discuss possible future designs. This image is describing how the greenhouse effect contributes to climate change. In this diagram, you can see that the sun's radiation is trapped within the atmosphere, allowing the Earth to heat up. However, this can be bad if, if there is too much radiation trapped in the atmosphere of the Earth. This image has to do with the topic that I'm talking about today, because the climate change and the greenhouse effect are changing based on increased greenhouse gas levels. Here are some different phases in the sun process growing over time, and the amount of radiation emit varies. In the image, you can see different positions of the sun, during different times, known as the solar cycle, this can affect the radiation levels emitted by the sun. Such events can cause su events such as solar flares, as you can see here, where the sun's where gases on the sun's surface extend further out into space than usual, or solar storms where large amounts of radiation are emitted from the sun. Here are a list of some anthropogenic or human-based causes of climate change. I will discuss today, I will discuss deforestation and the burning of fossil fuels. Deforestation is the act of cutting down trees in forests. This diagram shows how deforestation is very detrimental to our atmosphere and produces tons of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. In this figure, you can see that deforestation leads to emission of decomposing material. This can lead to more than 300 tons of CO2 being emitted per hectare which is in 100, 100 by 100 square meter. Here I'm showing how CO2 in the atmosphere can get absorbed into the water, which then increases the pH levels in the ocean, making it more acidic, resulting in fewer sea life. This figure shows and explains how fossil fuel consumption releases tons of CO2 when it stays in the atmosphere. This can then increase the Earth's temperature. The red arrow shows the process of how CO2 is emitted back into the atmosphere, and the black arrow on the left shows how ocean captures some CO2, but not enough to make a large enough impact. Here are some of the effects of climate change, and today, in the interest of time, I'll be discussing melting glaciers and ocean acidification. Climate change can impact glaciers, causing them to melt much quicker. This figure shows two pictures taken at the Muir Glacier in, the, in Alaska that are about a century apart. The image on the left was taken in 2004. This figure compares the amount of glaciers present about a century ago to those to present today. The melting of glaciers can affect wildlife that live in these cold habitats leading to species extinction. These are two these are two current technologies I use to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. Today I'll be discussing direct air capture. CO2 is focused on more than other gases because it has the highest radiative forcing uh, than other greenhouse gases, which means it has the highest property to trap heat on Earth out of these or force radiation back down to the Earth. Other greenhouse gases are also much less abundant in the atmosphere. This graph shows the amount of climate change by the end of the century and what will happen if we don't take action. The x-axis shows the time period, and if we don't take action soon, they can have detrimental effects. The amount of climate change by the end of the century depends on the decisions we make today. If we reduce CO2 amounts to stop increasing after 2050, the global average central temperature will increase from 1 to about 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is considered a best-case scenario, which is this blue line graph as you can see here. If we don't continue to reduce CO2 and the amounts continue to increase, the worst case scenario warming will be about 4.5 to 5 degrees Celsius, which is this red line graph. So what is direct air capture? Direct air capture is a process that is used to capture and store carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and is used to filter this out of the atmosphere. As you can see with this diagram on the left, it shows many different uh, green, sources of greenhouse gases then being captured and being captured by these filters 
and then stored for later use. They are then compressed while the other particles are released and transported and stored for later use and implemented in utilization. Another diagram of direct air capture filters is shown below. How direct air capture filters work is by having a carbon filter in the middle that allows gases that allows other gases to pass through, however, traveling CO2, then it heats this up and stores it in other concentrated weight areas and stores it in facilities. There are some strengths and weaknesses to CO2 and DIC filters, however. Some strengths include the efficiency, about how it's equivalent to about a thousand, it's about a thousand more effective than trees, and it requires a lot less land, and that it's also location independent, and it doesn't have to be placed in a specific location. As you can see with this sim simulation below, it's showing about the equivalence of one collector or one DAC plant to about 20,000 trees, and how the trees take much longer and are much more, much less effective than one collector. There are also some weaknesses, however. Some include the monetary cost. It's pretty expensive. It is estimated to cost about a thousand, a hundred dollars, sorry, per per metric ton of CO two. It's also energy expensive. It will take about three hundred exajoules per year, and it also does need to be placed near a renewable energy source in order to create an actual way of renewing and getting rid of uh, greenhouse gases. It also requires sufficient CO2 storage because once we take in all this CO2 and filter it, we need places to put it. On the left, this is an example of our current direct air capture filters. This yellow cone in the front being the intake fan and the blue cube is the box containing the filter sheet inside, which is this part. And the red cylinder on the outside is the exhaust and the excess particle output. As a new model idea I had was to implement two filters. In this new model, you can see on the right, it has multiple filters inside one of the fans. This, although it might be more expensive, would help us capture multiple greenhouse gases without needing to create a whole new filter. There are also some other possibilities for different types of filters. Another option is to change the shape of these filters. One such idea is the spheres instead of rectangular prisms as the casing because spheres have the smaller surface area of the object, which means they require a lot less resources. And they also have the largest volume, which offers a lot of more filtering capabilities. In conclusion, the use of direct air capture filters and other forms of primary capture are useful, but we should look for ways to improve and redesign these types of filters for future use, such as designing multiple filters for changing the shape or sh changing the shape of the item. Thank you for listening and here are my references. Sean, that was fantastic. I learned so much about those filters and their capacity to mimic what trees can do is like extraordinary. What was your spark for beginning this research? Um, I think mostly I have a pretty big interest in like climate change and also STEM and like solutions for it and part ways to combat it. And I've also done a bit of research on climate change before and other big problems like that. So I thought it would be it would be a pretty good idea just to try to start and do some research about this. Super cool. Thank you so much for your presentation.